Und da ist das für das Tube. Ich habe das Tube. Ich habe das Tube. Ich And then became increasingly interested in teacher development, how we help teachers to improve, spent a couple years as a researcher, and now work to help teachers uh, improve and to help the trainers of teachers improve. And the other the side of my life that's not shown here that I also um, kind of became really interested in Swedish education. So I visited, I think I claimed 10 times, I'm not, it's like 10, 11, 12 times in the last four or five years. Um, I've worked with Teach for Sweden, we can see people advertising Teach for Sweden here, there, smart pink hoodies, um, training new teachers to have a little bit of understanding of the Swedish context. Um, and I want to think a little bit about endemic problems as opposed to Exotic problem. So an endemic, well, an exotic problem is like the time that a, a wasp flew into my classroom and everything was chaos, all the kids are screaming, um, and I was like, why did no one train me in what to do now? But there's a good answer, right? Which is that actually, how often does the wasp fly into your classroom? It's not, not a good way to spend your training time. Whereas every single lesson, like when you go in on Monday, no matter how good your kids are, at some point, one of them is going to think, mm, I'm quite tired, I'm having a hard day, I think I'm going to like, just relax for the rest of the lesson. So we need to think, I think, about the, the endemic problems, the ones that definitely happen all the time, and worry about those. And I think feedback is one of the biggest endemic problems that we face. But don't let me convince you of that. You tell me, what problems do you have using feedback? Put your hand up if... If somewhere in, in your current practice you've got something that's not working perfectly when you give feedback to students in your time. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Matt, just uh, Time consuming. Time consuming for you, yeah. Yeah, they don't act on it. They don't do anything with it. I don't understand why the rest of you came. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not so specific. It's not specific for them. They all want their grades? Yes. All the time, yeah. What's my grade? What's yeah. my grade? No interest in the thing. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead. We have a language barrier. Go on. Because it's a lot bilingual school. Mm -hmm. So feeding back in English and actually their native Swedish speakers. Yeah. So it's doing it in a simple way that they understand. Yeah, and yet you're trying to maybe get across quite quite complicated concepts. Yeah. And you're not alone. Um, I dealt with these problems in, in kind of three phases. The first phase was, uh, well, my mentor in my first school, she was like, I mark my books every day till midnight. And I didn't want to mark my books every day until midnight. So I kind of let the books pile up, and then I, after like four weeks, I'd go through and I'd write, write some comments, and then the kids would ignore the comments. Um, <laughs> after a few years, I thought, I need to be a little bit more smart about this. So I started getting into um, experimenting. I was using code marking. So a kid writes something, I make a colored dot, the colored dot has some meaning, kid does something else. So it's interesting, it saves me some time. And then finally, I started reading some of the evidence around feedback. Um, and so if you are anywhere in this, I'm, I'm hoping just to save you some of the time because it took me like seven, eight years before I started doing things both efficiently and, and maybe smartly. Um, and I'm going to give you the frame. I was restructuring the talk yesterday, uh, and I was like, a really good frame for this is going to be the conversation that a mentor might have with their teacher. So you have a teacher who wants to get better at feedback. What conversation would you have? So if you're an experienced teacher, you might want to think in your head that, that you're the mentor, so like follow along with me what I might say. If you desperately want to get better at feedback and you don't think you're very good, you can pretend you're the teacher. Or you can ignore the whole frame and just, I don't really mind. Um, but anyway, here's, here's like the three phases of my discussion that I'm going to have with my teacher about how they get better at using feedback. First, I just want to like clear some ideas up in their head. Then I'm going to imagine they told me they want to improve my feedback and I'm going to talk to them about some specific problems, which fortunately are quite similar to some of the problems you've already named. Uh, and then we're going to work out what to do next. 
So what does my teacher need to understand before I go anywhere? Firstly, what is feedback? Like, we know feedback seems to help. If you read the literature around deliberate practice, they say feedback and modification of efforts in response to that feedback is one of the key points for getting better at any skill. If you read the review by Valerie Shu, she talks about how feedback can significantly improve learning, process and learning processes and outcomes. <coughs> so what is this feedback? I think the best analogy is the analogy of the thermostat. So I pick a temperature, say I want it to be 19 degrees, and then the radiator makes some heat, and then hopefully we reach 19 degrees. If we reach 19 degrees, it says stop. If we only reach 18 degrees, it's going to say, okay, a bit more heat. And this is the process that we, that is a feedback loop in engineering. This is the process we want to achieve with our students. We're going to send a signal about what needs to happen. They're going to act, and they're going to meet whatever that standard is. This is a bit dense, but, but the idea is feedback is only feedback if you close the loop. Feedback is only feedback if the kids actually improve. By which standard, many of the things we do in school maybe aren't feedback. Like when I was writing in my kids' books and then they were ignoring it, that's not feedback. That's just me writing in my kids' books for some reason. So anytime we're trying to get better at feedback, we want to keep this in mind. We have to close this loop. Thing two, why is it problematic? Here's one big reason. This is a, a, a meta-analysis. This isn't saying that it had no effect. It's saying that in over a third of studies, kids did worse if they got feedback compared <laughs> to the control group who didn't. Um, and we can think, we'll talk about some of the reasons for this in a minute. Um, but it's, and they still conclude that feedback is overall a good, a good thing. Um, but it's very, very easy to get wrong. Um, Dylan William talks about this quite nicely. He says, if you get it wrong, students might give up. They might reject your feedback. They might choose an easier goal. Even when they engage with feedback, they might just only think about short-term goals, not long-term goals. So how do I change this piece of work, not how do I get there? And then the third thing that's problematic is we often, at least in England, I think more generally, we often think feedback is the same as marking or maybe an American pub is parading. So we think that feedback equals writing in kids' books. But sometimes writing in kids' books isn't feedback, because they don't get better. And sometimes feedback isn't necessarily writing in kids' books. But we have, in England, very powerful school inspectors who mostly come and they want to see the kids' books. So if, it, if you just said it to them, it doesn't count. But that doesn't help us get feedback right. And then the third thing we have to kind of think about is... What comes before feedback? Our kids have done a test. Our kids have done a review test. And, you know, these kids got something wrong. These kids got something else wrong. These kids got something else wrong. What should I do? Should I speak to every kid individually? Should I help the kids just with one thing? If we focus on making feedback better, better we make life quite hard for ourselves. So sometimes... Maybe we just want to choose design a task that will only focus on one thing, so we only have to give feedback about one thing. Maybe the kids did the task badly because we didn't give them very good models. Maybe the, we didn't give the kids good models because our goals weren't very clear in our own head. Maybe we don't have like, a very good curriculum that guides our thinking. So quite often, I'll go to a school and they'll be like, we have a feedback problem. Quite often I think we can solve a feedback problem before we get to feedback. So we, I'm going to say, I'm not going to worry about feedback, I'm just going to focus on giving the kids better models, and then the, the work hopefully will get better. So those are my like preamble things, some things that helps to be clear about. What feedback is, it's really helpful, but it's really difficult, sometimes it's not the right focus. But my new teacher doesn't listen to me, and they're like, I just want to get better at feedback. Stop wasting my time. Tell me how to get better at feedback. So my first question to them is going to be like, what, already? <laughs> you want to give them feedback already? Are you sure the kids are ready for feedback? And why am I, when we talked already, I said 38% of studies in this meta-analysis turned up negative. Why might feedback be undesirable? 
Why might it not help people to learn more? Speak your hands up if you want. If they haven't learned everything they need to be able to do the task successfully in the first place. So then you're kind of wasting their time. You might as well just tell them what's missing. Yeah. So sometimes it's like you're giving these hints so they can guess the result. If the knowledge isn't there, it's not going to work. Thank you. Why else? Yeah. If they work particularly hard, they might think, oh, I've done really well. And now you tell them how to do something else. So yeah, so it's, it's, it looks like more work. And sometimes we know that kids think more comment, longer comments mean they've done worse. Even though sometimes we write longer comments because they've done something interesting. I was going to say it's similar to that, that you crush them. You crush them with your feedback. So you tell you that you need to get better. And I'm, like, oh, I'm done with getting better. Um, yeah. It has not always we create the opportunity, give them the opportunity to do the same task one more time. And then particularly they just point, you point out that this you need to improve and that one. Okay, they, they will be focused on those parts and then apply those in the other opportunity immediately, you know, in a month or in two yeah, months. Yeah, so they, they need that opportunity to get, to get better. All of these are true, we're going to come back to some of them. There's one other reason that I think is potentially really important. And I think I can illustrate this best by thinking about the time that my throat was really bad. But you know when it's more work to go in to set cover work? And so you go in anyway, because you're like, oh, I should go and teach the lesson. I had three lessons that day, and I thought, if I speak in all three lessons, my voice will disappear. So I'm going to speak in two, and for an experiment, I was still like young and a bit crazy, I'm going to have one lesson where I'm not going to speak at all. Um, and so I just made my normal PowerPoint, and I said, I can't talk. So I just showed them the PowerPoint slide, and then I'd be like, and so these are kids I'd already been teaching for one and a half years, and every single time I went there, the kids, because the lesson format doesn't change very much, the kids would be like, oh, now we need to discuss. Oh, now we need to write it in our books. So the thing that that taught me was, a lot of the talking that I was doing was a complete waste of time. <laughs> and, and I think sometimes we give feedback that doesn't add anything. So in the same way that I say, hey kids, you all need to write this in your books now. They know that, like, obviously it's the book. Obviously we always write at this time of the lesson. We give feedback about things that we should get kids to think about for themselves. The next slide's a bit, there's quite a lot on it. I'll show it to you for a bit, and then I'm going to blank it. Just have a look first. That's the answer. Um, so Oliver Kevin Leone, who's speaking elsewhere today, uh, designed this to try and capture a flow chart that I made. And the idea is like, for each question, I'll put this on, on Twitter later, um, for each question, sometimes the right answer is not to give feedback. So for example, do students know enough to benefit from guidance? If no, just reteach them. This is the example Ben just gave us, right? If the kids don't understand the basics, don't give them feedback. Just tell them whatever it is that's missing. Um, is the task difficult for students? If it's not difficult, don't give them feedback. Let them pick their own mistakes, or let them just continue. And is, are students fluent yet? Do they just need some more practice, and then they'll get it right? And so yeah, don't, don't worry too much about the details. The idea is, if you look through the literature, there's quite a lot of times that feedback might not be the best idea. That you can just wait longer. Let them struggle, let them think a bit harder. And a nice illustration of this comes from Atul Gawande's work on checklists. So he talks about how uh, doctors, surgeons, pilots, uh, architects use checklists to make sure people get everything right. So if you think of something simple like a capital letter, store book stuff, we teach kids that in like year two, and then we have our kids in year nine, year ten, and we're still going back over their work and saying, why is there no capital letter? Like, just give them a, che a checklist that says, go back through. Check for capital letters. Let them do it for themselves. So my students like, I want to improve my feedback. And my first thing is like, just don't. Let them think for longer about the task. Let them improve the task for themselves. But they don't listen, or they think that the kids have struggled long enough. So I'm like, OK, what do you want your students to improve on? Dylan William talks about how we, we want feedback to improve the student, not the piece of work. The idea is that something should change in the student so that next time they do better. 
I'm going to show you a load of situations, and can you just think of some recent times that you gave the feedback? This will seem really simple, but it's going to help with the, with the next thing. Last week. Can someone give me an example of a time that you gave feedback on the task? Like, you should change this in your. Stick your hand up, a bit of audience participation, make sure you're not falling asleep after the speech. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I did it yesterday. And what was, what was it on? What uh, you... We were using the computers and learning how to, um, how to do a layout. Using the computer, we were, what's the word? we were editing um, a, a little text. And so you were telling them how to edit differently, what, what changes to make. Thank you very much. Has someone done something recently where they talked about the subject. So this is what good maths looks like. This is what good history looks like. This is what good writing looks like. Go on. Thank you. Finished jobs that are successful. I think that that's underestimated because we are mistaken for cheating, but it's really uh, being good learners and repeat things. We need uh, patterns, we need um, good examples. So you're giving them this broader thing, you're going beyond the, the here's what to do today, and you're saying, like, this is what it should look like overall. Yeah. Any time you're doing yeah. this, it should look like. You just exchange details, really. Yeah. Thank you. And has, has anyone, maybe with your homeroom class, given feedback recently to your kids about, like, this? Th it would make your life a lot easier if you always did something like this? Yeah. Anyone can just one example? Thank you. Uh, in maths, just getting them to copy down the question is yeah. like an expression. I and mean, they always, lots of them yeah. never copy down and then they simplify. <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm I'm a history teacher, same thing applies, right? Just always mm -hmm. focus on the question. Okay, so, I told you, well, hopefully, you'll see it come useful. So the idea of this is, to, basically, I found like similar ideas in these three reviews, and I tried to pull them all together into one place. At the top, we have the really specific stuff. So like, put the capital letter. You answered the wrong question. Or like, write the, write the, write the question for this question. In the middle, we have this slightly bigger thing of like, good maths is. And here we've got this like, this is, this is how to be a better person. And the point that Hattie and Timberley make in their review is most of our feedback is at the top. We're usually telling kids, do this, do that. Um, and that's really useful if we want them to improve that task. But then they get to the next task and they don't know what to do. But if we just give them this general feedback, they don't know how to make the one task better. So quite a productive thing is to link these things up. So for example, you say, I want you to uh, redo question seven, and I want you to follow the order of operations. It's maths, so you multiply before you add. Or history teacher, um, I want you to redo this question. We always give evidence to support our argument. Give evidence here. So I'm trying to make a, a small point and also a big point at the same time. Why would this be in red? Not really education. Sensitive. It's sensitive. Uh, basically, like, don't do it, is, is the recommendation, right? <laughs> so if your feedback is getting kids thinking about, am I a good person? Am I, uh, like, am I successful? Do I belong here? Their attention is no longer about this because they're too busy thinking, like, does everyone hate me? Does the teacher hate me? Do I want to be in school? 
Um, so we're trying to give this without getting into this. All right, so here are some examples for you. So here I'm going to link follow order correct the class and the subject. Like an example. And then here I'm linking the subject and something to do with separate equation. So my second tip is like choose what you're aiming to do and link it up. Link the specific with the general. Link the general with the specific. And so my new teacher was like, okay, I know like, I've waited long enough, I know what I want them to improve on, I'm like, great, okay. Um, how are you going to ensure they actually do improve? We go back to our thermometer and we turn it into a real example. Like it, it, I give my feedback, but then it breaks down somewhere here all the time. And a couple of people who talked earlier said this, and they're like, you give the feedback and the kids don't do anything with it. Why is that? One reason, these reviews say, is quite often we don't give the kids the chance to improve. We give them the feedback and then we get on with the lesson. We can't create that loop unless we either say, here's your feedback, do it, or we say, here's your feedback, and then next lesson, we give them the chance to apply it on the next task, or something like that. English cultural reference, you know, Alice in Wonderland, White Rabbit is always short of time. We're so short of time, there's never enough time. If we're going to take the time to mark the kids' books, it's worth making sure that they actually use it. So how can we do that? I think one of the interesting ideas, sort of I steal from Doug Lemel, he talks about front the writing. You know how like, you have all this good conversation, then you get to the end, you have only three minutes for the kids to write stuff down. So Doug Lemel says, do the writing at the start. I think the feedback is the most useful thing in the lesson. You're giving them exact guidance to improve, so maybe we should do it first, not later on. And then we've got this issue that, that students often don't understand the feedback. <clears throat> let's, let's see what everyone thinks. So if you think a longer explanation made students more likely to respond to feedback, can you put down? Less likely. No difference. Okay. Uh, so... This is the first audience, obviously the smartest audience I've had, but that's probably a bit personal for feedback. Um, you're the first set of people who've said, no one said A. A is definitely not true. The, the answer is B. The more detail, it's quite a small scale study, but it's quite interesting. Man. The more detail you give, the less likely, and I think it's because it's just, the detail becomes overwhelming. Um, this review, mostly looking at university feedback, it says, Often, students can't even read the feedback, or they can't understand it, or it's using words they don't like. And it also says, students like quantity. They say, I want more, I want more. But then they don't know what to do with it. And then we get this emotional response. I get this feedback because the teacher hates me. I get this feedback and it means I'm rubbish at the subject. There's one really nice study that, that worked on this. They, the teachers marked the work normally, and then these researchers had a little post-it note, and they wrote this sentence in the teacher's handwriting. And then the researchers randomly stuck the post-it on some assignments. And the kids who received these post-it notes were more likely to rewrite their work, and when they rewrote their work, they were more likely to get a better grade, and they ended up liking school more. <laughs> and they talk about this thing, these, these two requirements, like, you have to believe that the feedback is because of high expectations, not because the teacher hates you, and you have to believe that you can actually reach those high expectations. So whenever we're giving feedback, I, want, I think we want to be, re like, repeating this message in a different way each time, like, I'm giving this feedback not because I enjoy it, not because I don't like you, because you can be better. I believe people can do well and you can be better. So the third thing I'm going to tell my teacher to do is set a clear task, make it super clear, and then encourage kids to show that they can actually fulfill it. Some of my teachers like, yeah, great, so you can have a clear task. Um, and then my last question it speaks to the colleague who was talking about time management. Like, how are you going to make this sustainable? <coughs> In England, we don't get to retire until we're 68. 
And that's a long time. That's a lot of books to mark. How are you going to make sure you don't burn out by the time you're like 27? Um, well, the first thing to be aware of is these guys did a review of the literature on marking two years ago. And they pretty much found that there's very little evidence that written marking makes a big difference. So the first thing we can say is like, it doesn't have to be written marking. We don't even have that much evidence for it. What else can we do? Talked about checklists already. Like, every time you get to do their maths work, there are certain things you're going to want to see in terms of presentation. Every time kids write an essay, certain things I want to see. I always want to see paragraphs, capital letters the title, your name, the date. I'm not going to waste my time writing, write the date here. We can also target what we do. Like We don't have to mark all of the kids' work. If the kids did 20 maths questions, we can just choose the three most interesting ones and just mark those. And that will tell us if they've mastered the idea. If the kids need the practice, we don't have to mark it all. If I'm marking an essay, I don't need to mark every paragraph. Maybe I'll just look at one paragraph and we'll focus on that. He talks about models. Um, Sadler wrote this beautiful paper where he talks about for students to improve, they have to have the same idea of quality that the teacher has. So I know what good writing looks like, they have to know what good writing looks like too. I don't think we can ever spend enough time looking at beautiful writing, beautiful music, excellent sport, and breaking it down with the kids, not just, you know, here's a good thing, now do it. Like, why is it good? What have they done? What words have they chosen? Um, and these, this guy who reviews student responses said, often models are more useful than feedback. So instead of writing something on everyone, you just write one example, and then you work together to break it down. So here's a, a really nice example of that. Um, he's marked all the things and he said, if you got a question with a triangle like that wrong, here's my new task for you. So find the task that looks like the errors you made and then do it. So everyone, like, I wouldn't want to write that in every kid's book, but I could write it once and photocopy it and then the kids can benefit from whatever they need. We can also spend more time breaking down the process. So we don't just have to give feedback about the task, we can give the feedback about how you do the task. So maybe we'll spend, instead of me giving a model of a paragraph, we'll write a paragraph together. I'm sitting on the computer, I say, what next? Oh, you disagree? What should I put instead? And so on. If you've got visualizer, that can be really nice. We could give the feedback verbally. You see that, like Dylan William talks about, if you want to see good feedback, go to a sports lesson, go to an art lesson, go to a music lesson. Because in, an, in a sports lesson, you don't wait till three weeks later to write something. You say, kick a bit more like that, and then they do it. And actually that's a lot less um, threatening for a kid. It, it, it sends the message we want to say. Like, you did it wrong, and now you're doing it right. And so if we can give feedback in the moment, change this. Oh, you did it, excellent. We're sending a really positive message and they've done the work well. And then I wrote a blog about this a couple of years ago and one of the most interesting comments on the blog said, um, sometimes we just, like, if, if we do formative assessment really well, we just obsess about like, oh, you made a mistake, let me change that for you. Sometimes the kids just need to do more practice. We don't always have to be like on their case trying to get involved. So my fourth sort of key thing is use alternatives to make it easier on yourself to make it more efficient. And here are my key points for my new teacher. I fired through like a load of research that are quite confusing to me quite quickly. So does anyone have any questions about these before we get to the final? Anything not clear? Anything you want to hear more about? No feedback. No feedback. No feedback for me, yeah? <laughs> okay, let's assume that all worked beautifully. Uh, now what? I mean, this is meant to come from you again, but let's see whether that works. Um, 
what might you do differently? And if we read the literature on behavioral psychology, when are you going to do it? Because if you pick when, you're actually likely to do it. What might you go and tell a colleague? Or what might you want to know a little bit more about? I'll give you one minute to the person next to you, share one thought, and then we'll hear a few. <laughs> Marking. And when you do the verbal feedback to a student in classroom, uh, often you judge them by, like good work, like a person. Mm -hmm. And to be able to switch your vocabulary, uh, how you say it to the student, that I think is hard and I need to practice that more. Yeah, and even as a, an adult, when I work with my colleagues, I try really hard, instead of saying, you have written a good suggestion, I say, this is a good suggestion, this is an interesting, mm. I talk about the object, mm. not the mm. person. Mm. I don't know what difference that makes, but it feels yeah. the same yeah. important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Other suggestions? Uh, well, I was thinking of doing like a, given like a success criteria for the homework, whether I code it, I don't know, and then get them to peer mark the success criteria that I get up the board, and then all I then need to do is look at the peer marking. If I agree with it, I do nothing. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the one thing I think I'd add, I think you, you, that's a really nice suggestion. The one thing I think I'd add is um, the giving them the concrete model as well as the success criteria, because sometimes the words of the success criteria, they're not quite sure what it looks like. So giving them the, like, this is what doing this really well looks like, that's what I want you to do. Might be helpful just to, to go alongside it. Great. Who else has got a nice thing they're going to do that's going to make their lives easier? No. Yeah, I was going to tell them proud about what you said. Mm -hmm. And it was um, basically the, the feedback is supposed to make the students work harder, not the feedback <laughs> harder, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. And also the, the high expectation, the purpose of this feedback is to be clear on that. Yeah, basically also trying to get them to write the feedback to mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. How would you do that? Well, I'm doing a thing now with, when, where they are actually marking their own tests. Uh, I've done it before, but I give them back the unmarked test, and we go through it, and they mark their own, or correct, they don't mark yeah, yeah. the points. And I just thought here now, that, well, then they should be able, to, at the end, to say, okay, mm -hmm. what did I write to myself as feedback? And this, this, this idea that they have to have this model in their head, that's a really nice example can they see what you can see? Yes. When they can see what you can see, they're becoming an expert like you. Lovely. Okay, well, 
What? Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, nice self-evaluation is just not doing that in terms of the person. Uh, however, it really works well and has worked well with me when the kids perhaps videotape themselves giving presentations and then after we've modeled it together, they write their own feedback. I read that, getting a nice piece of text from them, and just add one to the comments. I saw this done really beautifully in a dance classroom recently, where they're all videoing each other because then you can really you can pause it. You can see where's it gone wrong, where's it's gone gone right. So anytime they're pulling apart work to understand the components, I think is is really powerful. Um, so uh, if you want to know more, you can read a chapter about it in this book. If you prefer to read the book in Swedish, it's coming out as responsive to listening with no in September. If you don't want to pay money for the book, you can find quite a lot of stuff free. <laughs> and, and that's my Twitter, my email if you want to talk about it further. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.